Thursday's back. Yes, Thirsty Thursday with Scott from Catoctin Creek. We are so excited to have him here. Scott, give us a wave. Hello, this everybody. Is this is Scott. Long. And then we also have Philip here who co-hosts these with us from the Center for Culinary Culture. Thank you for Good being evening, here. Good evening, all. Yay. All right, we're going to give people a couple of minutes to settle in. So while we do that, I'm going to throw a poll up here. Um, because we love to know where we're starting from. Yeah. If you're already a rye enthusiast, if you're not sure about rye, if you've had Catoctin Creek stuff before, um, all that good stuff. So take the poll that we just threw up there. Um, <clears throat> Please and thanks. Oh, Danica, let's see, you can't hear us. Can everyone else hear us okay? Yeah? I can hear you. Okay, Danica, okay. I think it's just you. Sorry, Danica, <laughs> you hope you figure it out. Um, all right, so. And also, maybe while we're getting started here, throw in the chat where you're joining us from. I know we have people from all over the country joining us tonight, so we're super excited about that. Scott's in Virginia. Evan and I are in Massachusetts temporarily through the end of March. Um, Phillip's in California. So Los Angeles. Yeah, the three of us are spread out too. Yeah, everyone. Philip Dobard here from the uh, Center for Culinary Culture, uh, one of our sponsors of these uh, exciting Meet the Maker events. For sure. <clears throat> Culinary, drinks, all that good stuff. That's right. All things food and drink. We try to erase the false dichotomy between food and drink. Right. Yeah. We always joke. So we always kind of joke. We, we call our, our consumer guests and our, our fans and our audience, we call them Tipler Nation affectionately because we always joke that it's not fair that foodies get a word and people who drink like foodies don't get a word. So we're trying to bring <laughs> Tipler. We're trying to bring Tipler back. Yeah. Exactly. I remember... I remember some years ago, we when we first started posting, our, we post our, our our events and programs in I don't know many dozens of Facebook groups. Uh, when we first started posting in LA foodies, Los Angeles foodies, uh, uh, one person said, "This isn't food." He was shouted down by about several dozen other group members, and uh, we haven't had a problem since. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> All right, we have people from Ohio and Seattle and Maryland, Kansas City, New York City. All right. Oh, near uh, Great near the Rise State. Great Rise Vienna. State, Maryland. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, Vienna. Yeah. Fairfax and Vienna. I see. Yep. 35 miles from the distillery. Awesome. Love it. Some local love. All oh, right. Pasadena as well. Nice. You're close to Philip out there. Great. All right. Well, I say we get started. And as people join, they join. Rich. Yeah. Saying hello to our dear friend Philip. Rich Merrick. Hey Philip, how you doing? Just for the Very record, well. I actually I actually used the word tipler in, or tipple in a art article I'm working on for Artists of Spirit today. So oh, very good. And Rich, Rich Manning here writes for a number of publications, but he in the last year, I believe, interviewed uh Becky Harris, master distiller at Catoctin Creek. That is correct. I've actually she was a huge part of two uh Pieces I wrote, one for Artists of Spirit, one for Liquor.com. So uh, very good. Very happy to sit in on this session and uh, learn from her. Great. Well, yeah. Becky's Becky. the more literate of the two of us here. So <laughs> <laughs> Becky's, Becky's lesser half has the microphone uh, uh, tonight, um, but you'll learn a great <clears throat> deal from him. Well, that's okay. I'm excited to meet uh, Scott as well. So yeah. All right. Great. Scott, I'm saying I'm saying that as a fellow man. No, no, I totally agree. I totally agree. <laughs> Becky's greatest the men are always the lesser half, let's be honest. <laughs> Becky's greatest weakness in life was no argument. Me. Ah, no argument. Okay. Let's okay. get started, everyone. Um, welcome, welcome. I'm Suzanne. I'm the founder of the Crafty Cast. We are all about celebrating and supporting craft alcohol makers like the fabulous Catoctin Creek. So we're super excited to have them here. And my name is Evan. I'm a certified sommelier, a certified cider professional, whiskey enthusiast, um, equal opportunity craft beer drinker. He's your boozy expert. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, thrilled to be here and uh, continuing to share my love of all things craft alcohol with you. Yeah. So for those of you who maybe this is your first time with one of our public virtual tastings here, we are thrilled to have you. Um, and, you know, we like to keep these relatively casual. And so what that means is please feel free to unmute yourselves, ask questions. Um, we might mute everyone occasionally if there's background noise, things like that. So just be conscious of your background noise. But if we mute you, that does not mean we don't want to hear from you. We definitely still want you to unmute yourself, ask us questions. If it's easier to throw questions in the chat, that's fine too. We'll be keeping an eye on them to make sure they get answered there. But we want this to be a conversation because let's be honest, one of the best things about virtual <clears throat> tastings 
is that you get to be hang out with the actual owners and makers of these brands versus when you go and visit a distillery on a random Thursday, who they knows? might not be there, right? And so you have a captive audience with someone who really knows his stuff about whiskey and rye and, <laughs> and spirits cocktails. in general. And cocktails. Yeah. He's a great bartender. Um, so make sure to leverage that and ask him your questions and get what you want to get out of this. Um, we do these pretty regularly. Our next one is coming up in February. So mark your calendar, February 11th. We have a great grape spirit. So it's great base spirits, essentially. That's so we have, say, huh? yeah, great, great, that, great grape spirits. Say that five times fast. <laughs> um, so we have Pisco Lojia joining us and it's um, Pisco from Peru and man, it's phenomenal so Pisco. Good. Um, so they will be joining us, two of them. And then also Ansley Cole from um, Jermaine Raban. And so he's going to be bringing along his grappa. So it's kind of fun to explore two spirits that most people don't know quite as much about. So yeah. Pisco and grappa don't get quite as much love as whiskey. Um, and so we'll be having some fun with them on February 11th, also free to attend. Um, but there'll be lots more coming up. So keep an eye on our calendar, Center for Culinary Cultures calendar. We'll keep you informed. Um, but let's see. Any other housekeeping before we yeah, you know, kick off? Um, if, uh, if it's by chance anyone's first time on Zoom <laughs> at this point in our world. We did meet someone the other day who was their first Zoom <laughs> call amazing. ever with us. And we were like, what? Um, but there's a little button in the top right hand corner uh, to switch your view from speaker view to gallery view. And if you're not familiar with that, it's really fun to be able to see a bunch of other people's faces enjoying this. Makes it feel like more of a party. Um, so just a small little tidbit there. Yeah. And if you don't have <laughs> your camera on currently, that's okay. But we do love to see everyone's smiling faces. It also makes it feel more like a party. If it's a bad hair day, a, a not pajama shower day. day, your kids are running in the background, we don't care. This yeah. is we I all guess, have those days. I guess we can't say it's 2020 anymore, but I don't know. 2021 isn't isn't <laughs> shaping up all I'm, that. So I'm having a really got, bad got hair that day. song stuck in my head. <laughs> love it, love it. I'm having a particularly sorry. bad hair day today. <laughs> Philip, you have a permanently good hair day. That's the beauty of Thank your style. You. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you very much. I, I was going to say, I thought Philip's hair was particularly lovely today. That's right. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Josh. Exactly. Um, one last housekeeping thing before we get started, because we are going to talk a little bit up front first and hear from Scott about Catoctin Creek, their story, their brand. We're going to kind of just get you oriented with them a little bit please don't wait for us to start drinking. Please feel free to start drinking. So don't wait until we jump into the tasting to start drinking. Go ahead. Thank you. Yes. Cheers to you. We're going to pour some of ours as yeah, well. Let's do a little cheers. Um, if you have the sampler pack, the order that we're going to be drinking them in is the round stone first, followed by the distiller's edition, followed by the cask strength, if you wanted to kind of start with the first one. But we will be going through and doing kind of a tasting and talking about each one of these products a little bit later. Um, but please feel free to start drinking now. <laughs> we forget to say that sometimes. And then we're like, wait, are people not drinking? Oh no. Is it our fault? It's our fault. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Um, but with that, Scott, welcome. Thank Cheers. you. Thank you very much. I appreciate being here today. Mm -hmm. Nice to see everybody. Yeah. I've already, based on that, I've already poured my first drink and I'm having a sip too. It'll make my speaking going easier. See, it's already crappy. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> it'll, it'll make your listening going easier too. So I don't know what's wrong with my grammar tonight. The, it's um, okay, it's Thursday night. We're almost through the week here. I know, right? It's funny it's, you were talking about transposition. These, you were talking about doing these Zoom meetings and who you know people who haven't done it yet. And I've been doing these um, classes, you know, my own classes on Zoom. And uh, in my last series of classes, uh, it was like a six-part series every Friday night kind of thing. I had a guy who. Um, spent the entire series in a dark room um, smoking a joint. That was it. Like he was getting all he wanted out of that class, just sitting there in a dark room watching. <laughs> so whatever you need to bring to this meeting, you know, is what you bring. Yeah, on a sidebar, for those of you who aren't uh, aware of these, uh, these events or these, these classes that Scott is doing, uh, they're wonderful Super cocktail cool. classes that are very inventive, very creative. Um, Scott, you want to share the, the, the next round? I, I think that's just a fascinating way to uh, engage people. Yeah, we've been doing it. There's information on our website if anybody ever wants to pop over to CatoctinCreek.com. But basically, it's um, called Art of the Cocktail. And we do, basically, it's a cocktail instruction slash cocktail history class. Um, one of our participants here, Lyle and Dora, they, they're, they're participating in those as well. Um, and so this, this season, we're doing a six-week season. We're doing cocktails of things you'll find in your pantry. So last week, we did cocktails made with jams and jellies. 
um, mm. which was kind of fun and neat. And, um, and t this week we're doing cocktails that have um, hot peppers, hot sauce, things like sriracha in it. So some really neat little zippy cocktails that are kind of really tasty. Yeah, and that's a really fun series because sometimes, you know, these cocktail classes can mean you have to go out and buy quite a few special ingredients mm. and things. And, you know, while that's fun sometimes, it's even more fun to be able to make cocktails the way you make food, where you just like open mm -hmm. up your cupboard and you're like, what can I riff with here? What right. can I do? So I love that. Or, that's the or there are half empty bottles of things in your fridge and you say, what am I ever going <laughs> to do with that? Exactly. Well, I never we take like a make a cocktail from uh, Top Ramen. Yeah. Yeah, we make a, we make a uh, we take a liberal approach to the cocktail making too. You know, it's like if you can't find certain ingredients, like make a substitution. It's just a drink after all. Like let's not sweat it too much. Yeah, for sure. So. Um, all right. So with that, Scott, do you want to tell us a little bit about maybe you know how you guys got started, your sure. origin story, you know um, what you guys are up to, and while you're talking in a bit, I'll I'll show some pictures as well to kind of transport us all to Virginia. And all right. Us. I'll yeah, let you do the slideshow while I talk. Yeah, so basically, um, Becky and I started the company in 2009. We were both engineers. So I was a computer engineer. Becky was a chemical engineer. She was working in contact lenses and doing things like um, making computer parts and things like that, basically manufacturing process. And I was doing um, classified security systems for the Navy. And um, so that all sounds interesting. But basically, when I hit 40, I decided that I no longer wanted to sit in a room in a cubicle, you know, under fluorescent lights, typing for the rest of my life. Like this was my version of hell. And so I like to tell people on my tours when I give tours that 20 years of government contracting taught me a great love of whiskey. And uh, so I, I basically brought this idea to Becky saying, you're a chemical engineer, you would make a great distiller. And her response to me was, of course I would make a great distiller, distilling is easy. <laughs> From her perspective, distilling was easy as a chemical engineer. Um, she put it back on me and, you know, finger poked me in the chest and said, but you need to find out if we can make money making whiskey. And so she encouraged me to write a business plan. Um, this was in 2009. So 2008, 2009. So we're talking about the great, you know, recession that we were having. And uh, she said, go write a business plan, take it to the bank and see if you can get money. Knowing full well, the bank would say no. And then she would not be the villain in this story. She would be the hero. You know, it's like, well, you gave it your best, honey. I was really supportive. Now go back to work. We got kids coming to college soon. Um, and so the, the, the miracle turn for us was the bank said yes. And we were both like, holy crap. You know, we had a quarter million dollar check in our hands. And we we're like, shit, now we have to do this. I don't know if I can cuss on here, but I just did. Sure can. Um, <laughs> yeah. so we were like, holy crap, we have to do this. And so pretty quickly, you know, we never thought we'd get financing in that, in that great recession. Um, and we had it. And, uh, but, you know, when we went to the bank, I mean, they said, well, what's a distillery? Like they didn't even know what a distillery was. And oh. uh, maybe that helped us because they didn't. Um, but, uh, but we got the money and we started building the business. We quickly mm -hmm. got into Virginia, Maryland, DC, sort of the mid Atlantic area. And Today, we're in uh, about 27 states and um, internationally in Europe and Singapore and Mexico as well. So, you know, um, growing, you know, pretty fast. Um, we have uh, announced our, this year, we just announced actually this week, our uh, million dollar plant expansion to triple our production capacity to try to keep up with everything that we're doing. Wow, uh, congratulations. So, That's great. Yeah, so it's kind, of a, it's kind of a weird time to be, you know, doing those kinds of things. Um, but our investors have been very supportive and, uh, and they want to see us, you know, use this time well and, and continue to grow. Uh, I think with the vaccines on the horizon, you know, it's going to be a, a, la a launch pad to a really good year in 2021. So that's kind of what we're planning on right now is, is, is being very optimistic for 2021. Uh-oh, Scott, we missed your audio. Am I not on it? Uh, it just kind of disconnected there for a second. It seems... Huh. I've got a separate mic. Hopefully you guys, what, did you uh, miss out on a whole bunch or just the last? No, one? just a second there. You're okay. good. You're anyway, back. so yeah, so, so we're really optimistic for 2021. And uh, I can tell you a little bit about the origin of why we do what we do, why we make what we make and sort of doggedly stick to this kind of Virginia rye, if you'd like to know that. Yeah, for sure. I, I do feel like it's pretty rare that a distillery goes all in on rye yeah um, and so that's it's pretty exciting and i'd love to hear where that came from for yeah. sure so so one of the things becky and i really appreciate is history 
And when we started the company, you know, almost nobody was making rye. There were a couple of big houses making rye. Templeton, I think, had just come on the market, you know, but uh, there wasn't a whole lot of rye out there. And, um, and we were doing a lot of research at the time, trying to sort of find some niche in craft that we, you know, that really spoke to us. And so, you know, if you study the history of America, right, and of course, Virginia being one of the first um, uh, colonies in America, you know, in 1605, um, the first permanent establishment of European settlers is in Jamestown, Virginia, right? So that's 400 years ago, 1605. I mean, it's so long ago, right? And from the very beginning, a guy named George Thorpe is distilling whiskey in Virginia um, in the colonies, right? So 1600s, all through the 1600s, like if you just take the 1600s through the 1700s, right, till 1776, that's almost 200 years of human beings, Europeans living in Virginia, living in the mid-Atlantic, living in the 13 colonies, making whiskey. And when they were making whiskey, the way they were doing it for those 200 years was a small scale, what we would call craft production, right? It was necessarily craft because there weren't interstates and there weren't logistical supply chains and all this kind of stuff. You would grow some grain on your farm and whatever you didn't eat or wanna save for eating for bread and stuff would be distilled because it would rot or it would get mice. Yeah. And all these kinds of problems, right? So you could distill it and preserve it, but it was also useful to have spirit for medicine, for tinctures, for solvents, um, and it was money. So you could trade it, right? So you could distill a bunch of whiskey and trade it and then get meat and other things that maybe other farmers had. So nearly every farm had whiskey being distilled on the farm scale. So that says it's a small pot still, it's local grain, right? and um, its local tradition passed down you know, orally and, and from family to family. Well, that kind of production it, you know, for 200 years happens. And then in, the, in 1776, so we have a war right, with Britain, the Revolutionary War. And before that war, the common, most common and largest volume spirit in America was rum, not whiskey, but rum. So lots and lots of molasses and sugar and rum itself coming up from the islands and part of that sort of British trade triangle. And all of this rum gets cut off in 1776 because King George is pissed off with us for having a war, right? So he cuts it all off and we have a first real crisis in that we have not enough spirit to, to, to slake the needs of all these people who need it. And it is true because it was like actually a need back then. Like yeah. I mean, we say that jokingly, but there are all sorts of- There were Russians. There's, well, and there's documentation from like George Washington, I believe, from a few other like really, you know, famous historians from, from, yeah. who say basically like, we would not have won the Revolutionary War if it wasn't for like our rations of spirits. So when right. those started to get like pulled back, it was actually like a real threat to the morale of our soldiers, to the morale of the people making the guns, doing what we needed to do. Economic embargoes. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. right Indeed, on. and we weren't we weren't just importing rum; we were importing the raw materials. New right. England, New office. England was a center of rum production. Right. People think about New England. They said, "Well, no textiles, maybe, but rum." Yeah. Right. Yeah, there were like over a hundred distilleries that went back in those days that were primarily making rum in New England, and so yeah, that was a real opening, I think for whiskey to kind of come back in again and become as popular as it is today. Well, exactly. And so what happens is whiskey from that point forward really booms into an industrial production operation, right? Before it was small scale home operation, everybody was doing it for a long time. They knew how to do it, but then it really booms into something industrial, right? And so companies that kind of today feel like Michter's, you know, started to establish themselves in places like Western Pennsylvania, yeah. Maryland is a very big center of whiskey, Pikesville and that kind of area. And so those big industrial distilleries become established, right? And whiskey turns into business. And so then what happens is the Revolutionary War was very costly and they had to raise an excise tax to pay for the war. Well, all these Western distillers in Pennsylvania said, well, hell no, I'm not gonna pay the tax. We never paid it before. Why are we gonna pay it now? And so they have the whiskey rebellion, right? And George Washington himself has to go out to Western Pennsylvania and quell this whiskey rebellion, make them pay their taxes. And, uh, and so you, you kind of can see within a span of like 10, 15 years, you know, we go from basically little tiny home production to, you know, the equivalent at the time of like Anheuser-Busch kind of companies making whiskey, not quite that big, but pretty big. And so then of course, you know, presidency, George Washington has the presidency and then he retires. Well, he's got this whiskey thing in his mind and his, his um, farmhands 
have told him, you know, you need to establish a distillery here on Mount Vernon where he's retired. And he does. And he establishes the Mount Vernon distillery, which is a wonderful uh, place to visit today. They have a, a very faithful um, like rebuilding of that distillery complete with stills and they still distill whiskey there. And uh, you could see, you know, that kind of production. Well, in his day, George Washington was the largest commercial distiller. And so he was producing predominantly rye whiskey. So he was doing other things too, apple brandy and peach brandy and things like that, but it was predominantly rye whiskey. And this rye whiskey then dominated certainly Virginia, but really the whole mid-Atlantic area. And then as we swing into the 1800s, 1804, you know, we have the first documented um, recipe book or recipe written down of the old fashioned, which at the time was just called the whiskey cocktail. And then later, Wait, the year, old fashioned. Did you say that was? Because we tell this story in our corporate virtual tasting blog. Oh, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm curious you know, if, we, confirmation have the, of the if we have the same year. Yeah, so I heard 1804 is when, when we have the first documentation of the old fashioned at the time called the whiskey cocktail. And it was whiskey, sugar, water, and bitters, right? Yeah. And then we have, um, as it goes on, it becomes known as the old fashioned whiskey cocktail, and then later just the old fashioned. But then as we get into the later 1800s, of course, the Martini, the Manhattan, all of these other cocktails become invented. And if you're in the East Coast, right, New York particular, New York City, you're drinking rye whiskey. That was the common spirit in that. If you were in the frontier, um, which of course at that time was like Tennessee, Ohio, Kentucky, you know, those are the Western countries or counties out there, then you might be drinking some bourbon. And if you're in New Orleans, you're drinking cognac almost certainly. So yeah. those kinds of things, those regional things, if you were on the East Coast, which we are here, you're drinking rye whiskey. And of course, it all comes to a screeching halt, you know, in 1920, right? Mm -hmm. And everything comes to an end. And so that history, and it really never comes back like it was before as the dominant spirit of, of America. And we wanted that history to be told. And so what we're really focusing on when we're making Roundstone Rye is we're making it in that traditional Virginia style. So we call ourselves the Virginia Rye Whiskey. And that's because we'll use local grain, right? Which is organically grown. We're not organic because we think it's healthy or a bunch of granola nuts. It's because it's the closest that we can get to heirloom quality grain that would have been made back in the time. And it's also been not treated with herbicides and pesticides, which of course, you know, would, would create off flavors that have to be aged out in the barrel process. Um, so local production, organic grain, pot stilled whiskey, that's very important. Pot stilling is, is key. And look at those handsome fellows. I just have my, <laughs> my, my chrome dome shined in that picture. Um, the uh, pot still. Beautiful whiskey. shot. And, uh, and then the, the last uh, thing is, of course, the terroir, right? The terroir of the, not just the grain that we're growing here mm -hmm. in Virginia, but also the aging of the whiskey in that climate, that climate of, um, you know, the hot summers and the cold winters and the crazy springs and falls where we have temperature going back and forth. And all of that produces for us basically a very traditional whiskey on today's modern equipment, which gives us reliability and safety and all those kinds of things. You can see the stills here. These are German stills that we use um, producing that spirit, but there's still a pot still process, which is really, really key to the whiskey production is using that pot still mm -hmm. process. Yeah. Uh, Scott, I think it might be, might be worth mentioning here that uh, bourbon uh, uh, came to predominate in, um, in the, on the frontier because corn grew better than rye. Right. The right. conditions, the, con the conditions were favorable, more favorable to corn than they were to rye. Yeah. And, 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 and the opposite when you're talking about the East Coast where we are here. Indeed. Right. So if you're in Virginia, all the way up into Quebec, right, you're talking about rye growing really, really well here. It grows like grass. And, mm -hmm. and like you said, out West, bourbon, corn, you know, people are going to make what they make because of what grows where they grow. Right. And that's why you have barley in Scotland and they don't have, you know, a whole lot of corn. In I Scotland. think it's important important to note that whiskey is an agricultural product. Absolutely. At, you know, at least originally. You know, it, they had surplus grain. So what do they do to extend the life of it and to make some money? Make whiskey. There's still right. whiskey. And you used what was on hand, indeed. Uh, now, this is often, this is why uh, uh, rye is often referred to as America's first whiskey. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And so many people, even today, don't really understand that or know that. And that's the history we want to tell in every one of these bottles, you know. So we do, there's hand production right there. I mean, that's what it's all about. We literally are handling this stuff. These are 30 gallon barrels because that was the biggest barrel that Becky herself could move around. Um, that's Becky there with the hair. Um, 
<laughs> that's that's, that's the reeling. That's the reason most ceilings are eight feet high today because one one eight foot length of sheetrock is what one person can carry. Yeah. <laughs> The, uh, this is the picture of our barn. This is actually really nostalgic for me because this is a picture of our whiskey aging barn. Um, we're no longer in this barn. The barn actually fell down. It's not, it's not safe. It didn't fall down while we were in it, but it was, it was not long for this world when we were using it. And we've since moved to a more uh, modern production facility. Um, every single bottle here being signed by Becky uh, as we do this. Um, the, uh, so yeah, that, that, you know that rye production was just really important to the to the uh, the tradition that we have. You know the two keys of that. You know is like when we're fermenting, we're fermenting at room temperature. So that is, you know, if you were in the 1800s, you didn't have a chilled glycol, you know, perfectly controlled fermenter. You had, you know, subject to the seasons. And um, and then the pot still is really important as well because in the pot still you have actually a Maillard reaction. So this is a change that happens because of the cooking of the grain. And the analogy that I really love to use for that is like the, the cooking of tomato um, sauce on your stove. So if you took tomatoes fresh from the garden and you pureed them and drank them right away, they're very bright and acidic, right? But then if you take that same puree and then you put it on the stove for six hours and you just cook it at a low simmer, it's going to change, right? It's going to get caramelized and sweet and it's going to get richer and, and things are going to happen. These chain reactions are going to happen. And that's what's happening with the rye. So the fact that we're in this, um, in this still cooking this rye for nine hours, um, what comes out at the end isn't what came in at the beginning. We're getting a lot of richness in this spirit that wouldn't be there if we were just flash column stilling it and pulling out the extracted alcohol within a few minutes, which is, of course, much more efficient and cheaper. But we really feel like it's, a, it's an important you know, point to differentiate our product by pot stilling it. And, I guess that's why all the Scottish do it as well, because they really, I mean, that's key to their process as well. So we kind of attach ourselves to that tradition as well. I like now, your fidelity to history a lot. That's really, it's pretty compelling, Scott. It makes for a great case for, you know, why doing things the way that they were done years and years ago is uh, versatile and worthwhile to continue pursuing today. Yeah, I agree. You know, it's funny because when we started this company, of course, we, we started putting this whiskey out. And we would often hear from some people, you know, who maybe, you know, you might say whiskey snobs or something like that, who had certain opinions. Well, why aren't you putting it in 53 gallon barrels? And why aren't you doing this? And why aren't you aging it for this amount of time? And all of this kind of stuff. And why don't you have a mash bill of X, Y, Z? And, you know, it's like, well, look, you know, Heaven Hill or Bardstown or whatever, you know, these people are already doing that. Why should we do something else? Let's do something different. And then you can either like it or not like it, right? And, yeah. and, and that's up to you. But if we're all doing the same thing, then what the hell's the point? So, and that's, the, and that's really what craft is all about, at least exactly. for us. We always say it's yeah. like art and science, right? And anyone can do the science. Yeah. Anyone can press the button and get consistency to come off a line. That's right. easy. It's the like using your judgment and kind of doing things differently and changing things up every time you do that. Like that's art, you know? Right. And it, we often compare it to finding a musician you really love. You find a musician you really love, but you don't want every album to sound exactly the same. You look right. forward to seeing what that new album is going to sound like. And that's the same thing with the next batch of whiskey. Or when they right. play that song live and you're like, well, I never imagined it that way. Yeah, well, exactly. you know, it, it's, 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 it's true. You know, like, um, like I'm learning to play the piano right now because that's my quarantine activity. And every now and then, like you hit the wrong chord, right? But you're like, hey, that sounds nice. Like that's a nice chord. And that's the art of it, right? Yeah, Serendipity. Exactly. Yeah. And sometimes you stumble onto something like, you know, aging something in a Chardonnay cast because you had it and you're like, holy crap, that actually turned out nice. Oh, yeah. So, so that's uh, another reason why I think uh, craft spirits are important, uh, what you're doing, Scott and uh, Becky, because that's where the real innovation is coming from. Uh, you know, you get your some of your bigger uh, spirits, uh, your bigger distillery brands, and they're not going to go and do something uh, that's outside the normal parameters right you guys don't have anything to lose and that's where the innovation and move the uh spirit category forward so thank you for that yeah thank you i appreciate the appreciation you know one of the things when we first started putting this product out in the market and this was like 10 years ago now um you know 90 percent of the rye in the market was coming from mgp from indiana right and it's perfectly delicious rye um but it has a very distinctive flavor right and the flavor is the flavor of you know, dill and mint and green vegetal flavors, right? And our rye typically is coming across much more like fruity, nutty kind of flavor. And so people would tell me, they'd say, this doesn't taste like rye. And that's because, of, you know, the 75 bottles that they've had that's MGP 
all tasted the same. So they assumed that's what rye tastes like. And, and I would be somewhat offended by the question. I'd be like, what do you mean it doesn't taste like rye? It's 100% rye. How can it not taste like rye? And so what we had to learn really, and it's, it's only just recently that we've really learned how to, how to put words to this, is we're talking about terroir. It's like this rye grown in Virginia tastes different. And that's a good thing. Let's enjoy that. Let's celebrate that. Nobody expects a Pinot Noir from Oregon to taste the same as a Pinot Noir from, right. from France or from California or whatever, you know, and, and that's understood. And we're just trying to make that knowledge also into spirits. Scott, couple, 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 couple questions. One, um, you said 100% rye. Your rye, all of your rye are 100% rye. That's right. Um, that so is not... That is not altogether common in rye production. That is correct. And we are gluttons for punishment, and that's why we do it. Um, it's very so difficult to work with. It is very difficult. It's very sticky. Um, and you have to use enzymes to, to sacrifice the starch because the rye itself isn't very good at that. Um, we, we use um, four different sources of rye. So even though it's 100% rye, one of the things that we um, have developed over time is multiple different farms that we use. So we have the pictures you saw earlier were from Rappahannock. So that's about three hours east of us towards the ocean, towards the Chesapeake Bay. And so it has a maritime kind of climate um, where it's drier and, and stays warmer longer. Um, and then we have um, rye that's coming up from like Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. You know, so that's kind of within about 60 miles of here. So it's a little more inland. We have rye coming from this county that we're in right now. And so all of those different ryes together, different strains, different regions, um, if you took any one of them by themselves, you'd have a very sort of one dimensional flavor profile, but you add those together and you've got some complexity. Some is a little sweet, some is a little spicy and those kinds of things come together and create something that's more interesting than just the single grain itself. And it also gives us diversity from our farmers. If a farmer has a particularly bad year, we're not you know, caught with our pants sure. down. So that's just right. kind of- It's smart. like rotating crops. Uh, yeah, as it were, exactly. indeed. The, the other question is, and this matters This matters not to the quality of your spirits, but uh, your spelling of whiskey, it is, it is old country. It is, it is. It would have been spelled that way in the 1700s, 1800s, actually. Of course. Um, and we also, in modern parlance, you know, you'd say that American whiskey with an E, Canadian with a Y, Irish with an E, Scotch with a Y, right? Mm -hmm. And... We, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big nut for Sc everything Scottish. I have two kilts. I wear them even on Zoom calls. Um, <laughs> the, uh, and so it was a bit of a nod to our Scottish ancestors. We figured if other brands are doing it, Maker's Mark does it, you know, then, then mm -hmm. we should do it too. So we just kind of enjoyed it. It's our company. We'll do what we want. So Yeah, for those of you not familiar, um, a, fun, a fun catch to remember which is usually the spelling in most places is if the country name has an E in the country name, they put an E in their whiskey typically. And if they don't, Japan, Canada, they don't, Scotland. they don't put an E in their whiskey. That, that's an easy cheat to kind of remember the norms, but there certainly are. I think Balcones spells it without the E as well. Yeah, there's a lot of there are certainly people who, who march to their own beat of the drum because it's not regulation at all. Yeah. Actually in the code of federal regulations, it's spelled without the E. So all of the, the federal laws actually spell it the way we spell it. So, you know, all right. it, it, yeah. it's, it's funny because when we were doing the business plan, of course, contextually, I was spelling whiskey exactly as it was supposed to be spelled, depending on the context of how I was using it. And, and then I had my business plan reviewed by an entrepreneur who was in the construction business. And she knew nothing of whiskey, but she was a very smart entrepreneur. So I wanted her opinion. And she went with the red pencil and she's like, you are illiterate. You need to straighten this up and spell whiskey right the whole time. And I was like, oh, it's too hard to explain. Just, okay, I'll fix it. <laughs> so funny. Hey. Scott, Scott, how does, um, he, I, I'm a big fan of the Pendleton 1910 rye. How does, which is also 100% rye mash bill. How does, how does yours compare um, flavor profile wise to something like that? Because I, unfortunately I haven't had yours yet. Yeah, so, well, I haven't had theirs yet, so <laughs> I can't oh, okay. explain too much. But what, what you'll get in ours, and I'll go through the flavor notes when we taste it officially here tonight. But generally, I would say fruity, nutty, you know, heavy tones of citrus, and then definitely that little bit of a tingly spice sort of finish that you, you know it's rye. Um, the, uh, so comparing it to other ryes, you know, it's easier to compare it to MGP because everybody's had MGP. And MGP, beautiful, solid rye again, typically has a, a bit of a more grassy dill kind of 
kind of profile that that is completely not present in in our rye. Um, there's yeah, and couple. I will say often, you know, anything that's 100% rye, I mean, rye is spicy on its yeah. own, right? Yeah. And that's usually why people put, you know, barley in there, wheat in there, other things to kind of mellow it out a little bit. So like, <clears throat> if you like rye, these are good. These are punchy, they're spicy, but they're well balanced as well. Mm. Um, so it really, it brings that characteristic of rye that you likely love if you're a rye drinker, turns it up a little notch, but then rounds it out really nicely. Yeah. Um, with that though, Scott, why don't we jump into the tasting? We can keep talking and answering sure. questions as we do, but Absolutely. I'd love to, for those of you who have the sample pack with us or one of these bottles, get um, to chime in and kind of converse about these. Yeah, for sure. So the first one we'll taste is what we call our Roundstone Rye 80 proof. So you'll see the 80 proof there of just above the monogram and it's our single barrel, it's the red label. So if you have the red label, that's the one to do. I've got the big 750s here in my house, but um, the little ones will do as well. So if you pour yourself a slug of that, let's just start with the nosing, shall we? Oh, that's really, really lovely. So, you know, I get sort of toasted bread and, and I get citrus right away. I always get citrus, lemon particular for me on the nose on these. All right, and so now I'm gonna take a taste. Be sure to put in the chat window, if you guys have certain things you're tasting, if somebody says, you know, whatever, raisins or whatever it is, you know, just, I'd love oh, to read tobacco. that if you guys do it. Tobacco, tobacco for sure. Tobacco for me, big tobacco. I, tobacco. I told Becky this when we interviewed her for the podcast. Yeah. I'm getting like a kind of an anise biscotti type of yeah. thing. Yep, yep. I think that biscotti kind of ties in with what I was saying, kind of like toasted bread. You know, yeah, that kind yeah. of a fit note with the sweeter element, you know, like those breads that have embedded fruits in them. Mm -hmm. for, for those of you, let's take a little, a little detour for a half a second here. Um, we, we, we teach a lot of, we do a lot of corporate tastings and we teach whiskey tasting techniques as we do that. And so I think it's fun as we're going to dive into these a little bit. Let's just give a couple of those like high level tips on nosing and why that's so important. So, you know, if you've ever had a head cold and your significant other orders pizza when it's your favorite dish in the whole wide world, even though you have a head cold and you take a bite of it and it tastes like cardboard because your nose is stuffed, that tells you why you're no, like smelling your whiskey before you drink it is so important. 80% of what you taste is actually coming from your nose. Yeah. Um, and so the more time you spend nosing things, smelling it while you're drinking it, the more you're going to get out of it. And there's a couple of fun techniques because there are different different types of aromas in here. Some are heavier, some are lighter and kind of float right out of the glass a little bit. Um, some are coming from the grain, which are floral grassier notes. Others are heavier kind of baking spices, vanilla that's coming from the barrel aging, right? And so being able to kind of find all of those different things in there can really enhance your appreciation of the whiskey. Um, and a couple of tips as you're smelling your whiskey, A, don't stick your nose in it like a wine glass. We're all so trained with wine to like really get on in there. Yeah, it's the, so, the opposite so of wine. <laughs> um, so keep it lower, maybe around your chin a little bit, up near your mouth kind of, and kind of move it around a little bit. And then there's, if you do a low, slow inhalation, almost like a yoga breath or a meditation breath, you're going to find kind of certain aromas versus if you do kind of a dog sniff. So if you sniff in and out really quickly and actually... Sniffing out so you're adding a little humidity into that glass while you're doing it is totally okay, even if you fog it up a little bit, because that's why <laughs> dogs smell that way. They're adding humidity to whatever they're smelling so that they can smell it better. And that will help you find different hmm. notes in there. And yeah. so those different kind of approaches, play around with that a little bit to see if you can find different aromas. And there really is no wrong answer. There are certain things that you're gonna feel silly saying, but really the ones that you're gonna feel silly saying, those are the ones we wanna hear because those are the ones that are really fun to kind of unravel and figure out like what you're smelling and why you're smelling it and what memory it's triggering for you. Um, so it's, it's a really fun part of the experience that I feel like a lot of people kind of skate right over and think yeah. that we're just doing it to be like snobby and like pretentious, but it really enhances your whole experience. And especially when you're spending time with craft spirits that maybe you're spending a little bit more money on, it allows you to like experience them fully. It allows you to kind of almost transport yourself and travel through a glass, which we mm -hmm. all need right now. So I just I wanted would, to- I would say the one rule is not to plunge your nose into that glass because you are gonna get the whiskey equivalent of a wasabi rush. Right. Yeah. 
Right. It'll just be like rubbing alcohol. Um, One of my favorite techniques with regard to olfaction is um, this uh, kind of fun technique, particularly with spirits, that's known as retronasal olfaction. So orthonasal olfaction is basically just smelling something by breathing in. But you smell things on, when air is leaving your body too. And so a technique that is really helpful with spirits because of the fact that sticking your nose in a glass of whiskey can burn your, can burn your olfactory out, as Philip was just saying, take a sip of whiskey with a full lung of air. And then when you swallow it, keep your mouth closed, press your tongue up into the roof of your mouth and exhale, exhale rather forcefully out your nose. And you'll actually smell the whiskey on it's the way, way out. out. Um, yeah. Now, just be careful not to do that and have the actual whiskey go out your nose. That's even worse than <laughs> that your nose party out. tricks. And you're burning that would out. not be good. Yeah, for sure. But something else fun to play with. Yeah. And when you're tasting your whiskey, you know, there's a couple of things. If you spend some time smelling it, when you taste it, you kind of want to assess, does it taste like what you thought it was going to taste like based on the smell? Or does it taste very different? And neither of those are wrong. Those can be equally fun to like explore, like, oh, that tastes just like I thought it would, or like, whoa, what is that? Um, so that's one thing you're looking for. The other thing to be careful of is don't ever trust your first sip. Your first sip of alcohol, especially when it's high proof, is really just your mouth acclimating and kind of being like, whoa, that's alcohol. It's a primer code. Yeah, and so they, they have a term called the Kentucky Chew, where you, if your first sip, you put it in your mouth and you do kind of like chew Roll it, it around in there. and move it around a little bit and get it to touch all the different parts of your mouth so that your mouth is fully acclimated, then take a second sip and then start to assess it after that. Yeah. Or if you're like me, just don't stop drinking all day and you're ready to go at any time. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Keep your mouth acclimated all the time. I, you know professional what? drinking. Professional drinking is I what we're I am. Uh, I never knew the thing about the dogs and the humidity. That's really cool. Yeah. That's really cool. The introduction moisture. I mean, if you travel to Florida and then travel to Arizona, you smell things more in Florida, for better or for worse. Yeah, yeah right. No, for worse. Um, <laughs> anybody here from Florida tonight? Anyone? Anyone? No. Um, the, uh, I've lived in Florida. The uh, there were a that couple questions. A lot, Philip. There were a couple questions. That <laughs> hey, I grew dry. up in New Orleans. I'm stylish. It's in my DNA. <laughs> See, it balance, balances out then. That's right. Yeah. Hey, Scott, you're right. There were a question, couple of questions about rye in the chat. Did you want yeah, to? Yeah, I was just going to hit those for Mark if, he, if you wanted me to. The, um, Mark, uh, we have, you know, as I said, four different farms, and, and they all average around 70 to 100 acres um, for, for each of those farms. And those guys are producing for us. Um, so those are special contracts that we have with those farmers. Um, the, uh, and the rye is typically planted in the early spring. So it's a spring crop. We typically are harvesting that in the latter part of July. And I say we, meaning not I, meaning the farmer. <laughs> the collective, the royal we. Yeah, I have a, I have a uh, spectator's involvement in that harvest. So, um, but we do like to work with the farmers and, and keep pretty close up with them. Um, just on that, on that note, Scott, uh, given that my primary background with alcohol is wine, that was my first love. Um, there's obviously, uh, with, with wine and, and the cultivation of grapes, there's a lot of discussion with regard to yield and the process in growing. And sure. given that they're growing just for you, um, do you have influence or, or, or kind of say over how they're growing? And are there techniques that you can um, influence the way the product, the final product that you're making your whiskeys uh, will be, you know, make, make for a better whiskey? Yeah, so absolutely. So there's a lot to unpack there. So the first thing I wanted to say is I also started in wine. So when I was 16 years old, I worked in a winery as the intern and I got to do everything from crushing to bottling, even sparkling wine. So, you know, props to being in a wine background. Um, the, um, we, we like to collaborate with the farmers, right? So we're not dictating so much as trying to find some, something that works for everybody, right? So I'm not a farmer. Becky's not a farmer, so we don't try to be farmers. Um, you know, people ask us if we grow this grain ourselves, and I'm like, good Lord, no, that's a lot of work too. And so, you know, like one of our farmers, Timmy, who, who is the farmer out in Rappahannock, you know, we go and we talk to him, and he's like, I'm thinking of planting these varieties this year. Um, you know, I've been talking to the people at the Virginia Tech, you know, um, ag department, you know, and they think these will work well in Virginia. You know, so he's done his research, but then on our part, you know, we're looking for does it have a good yield? Does it convert a lot of starch into sugar, which means a lot of alcohol coming out of it? Um, does it taste good, right? So when we get a new strain of, of grain in from someone like Timmy, 
or any farmer who might come to us with, you know, wanting us to buy their grain, we're going to run a single mash of just that grain by itself so that we can taste. If we know what the new make spirit is going to taste like, then we know it's going to be good in the barrel. And so we'll do that. And we've rejected certain grains because they don't taste good. So we've rejected grains because, um, you know, they taste dusty, like they were pulled dirt from the floor. Um, and, and so it's just not good enough. We also will reject Scott, grains. Isn't, Scott, isn't that what they call terroir? Yeah, <laughs> a different terroir. kind of terroir, but it's got to be good and not terror <laughs> as opposed to terroir. <laughs> so yeah, trademark Scott Harris. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the other reason we can reject grain is, is because of, of um, imperfections like fungus, right? So we inspect the grain visually for things like ergot, which is a very dangerous fungus, fungus that can infect grain and we can't have any of it in our stuff. So we'll inspect that. And that shows good crop practices, especially when you're, when you're using organic practices and you can't just sort of blitz the whole um, field with fungicides. Um, you've gotta be more thoughtful about how you do that. And the farmer will have concerns like, does this grain, like if it rains, it, does it lay down and then I can't combine it, you know? So if it, you have to be able to harvest it. It can't just be heirloom for heirloom's sake. Um, the guys at Virginia Tech, you know, laugh. They're like, you know, some of these heirloom grains are heirloom for a reason. Um, so, you know, you can't just be sort of all artsy about it. You've got to have some, some, some sense and some science in there as well. Um, so, yeah, so it's really a partnership that we have with the farmer and an open dialogue that continues every year, every year, every year. Cool. That's, that's great. Thank, uh, thank you for that. That's some neat background. And so, Scott, as we're drinking through these, are these all the same base rye whiskey? They are. They are. I hadn't talked about that yet, but this is uh, at the stage of the distillation, okay? So once we've done our heads, our hearts, and our tails of our distillation, and we've taken the hearts, the very best part of it, and put that into the barrel to age, these are all the same. And so they go off and they age, and then mother nature takes over, something that we can't control. And so what we found when we're pulling these out of the, the, the barrel house, Becky will pull samples to taste. All three of these are single barrel whiskeys, right? So we want to have some consistency in these products. Um, and so when she tastes the whiskey, 90% of the time, the whiskey is going to be soft and round and buttery. And that's going to be this one, right? I mean, buttery is kind of a textual or a, a texture word, not really a flavor word for me in this case, but that softness and that mm -hmm. easy drinking nature of this 80 proof rye that the first one that we started with, that's going to be what we end up um, distill or bottling it at. Now, Sometimes about one barrel in 10, we'll find a, a barrel that exhibits a spicier profile, a deeper, richer profile of things like um, clove and cinnamon and nutmeg and those kinds of baking spice kind of flavors are coming through. And then we'll bottle that at 92 proof. And that's Becky's distiller's edition. So when she started seeing some of those barrels coming a few years ago, you know, they were just naturally popping out with that flavor. And this would be a good time to go ahead and taste that expression if you're, if you're not doing it she was noticing interesting other flavors in there and tasting those with a lot of her staff in the distillery and kind of coming to that decision to this one tastes better preserved at the 92 proof. Now, one barrel every say 100 will be so perfectly beautifully balanced, just naturally the time we hit it when we took the sample was perfect. Whatever it is, the grain and the wood and everything is so well done and it's really drinkable and smooth on its own then we'll bottle it at cast proof. And that cast proof is something really special. It has so much richness. You know, people always think it's just higher in alcohol, but no, it's higher in everything. It's a concentrated whiskey. It's never been diluted, right? So you've got more wood flavor. You've got more vanilla flavor. You've got more all of that stuff. And, um, and it just makes a really, really yeah. decadent proof, spirit. Proof is first an indicator of flavor yeah. or should be. And yeah. secondarily, an indicator of heat. Yeah, absolutely right. And the, the brownstone... Um, cask when we get to it, I think you'll find it has surprisingly little heat for the alcohol that is there. And that's a really neat testament to Becky's ability as a distiller. She can produce a really smooth, I mean, you, she always tells me, Scott, you have to respect the juice. Like you can't just drink that like 80 proof liquid, which I do foolishly. Um, but <laughs> it, it is really, 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 really good. Um, now, another thing that sets you apart is that all of your whiskeys are single barrel. Indeed. Yeah. And, and that, that came, it started as basically we were small, right? And we didn't have 
a big reserve of inventory of whiskeys to cross blend to get some uniformity and things. So we had to use our nasal and our olfactory, um, I guess those are the same thing, the, um, so our, our eyes and our nose and our mouth, you know, we were using our senses to produce a whiskey that was consistent from bottle to bottle to bottle. And so even today, that's how we do it. Becky has a team of about four or five of her employees, all women, by the way, she, she believes the women have the better palate for this. Um, and they'll lower the proof and do different tastes at different proofs um, and determine what they, what they can tease out of these whiskeys to get them in here. And they're doing a hell of a job because the consistency between the lineup is great. So that gave us by sorting flavor, instead of, um, instead of blending flavor, by sorting flavors, we're able to get a single barrel whiskey that has consistency across those three product lines. Uh, something that I'm curious about, since these are all single barrels, um, and you, you know, mentioned that it's simply by experience that you decide which ones are going to be 92 or which ones are going to be cast. Mm. Have you noticed any kind of pattern with regard to your, uh, you know, your cooperage sources and particular forests or, uh, you know, coopers that are making barrels that tend to be candidates for cast strength? Yeah, so that's a great question. That is a great question. We haven't figured it out yet. We're sort of honing in on the fact that, you know, we st about three or four years ago, we started introducing Virginia oak into the mix. So we were using before that just exclusively Minnesota oak. And we wanted to see what the Virginia oak would do to it. And of course, if the flavor took a big left turn, then we would have to figure out like make a new product line or something like that. But as it turned out, when Becky started doing taste trials at 80 proof, there was no difference in the flavor between the Virginia oak and the Minnesota oak. She couldn't tell the difference in a blind taste test, in huh. a blind, you know, like a truly blind sort of sampling survey or whatever. And no, nobody else could either. And then when we sampled the, the Virginia oak and the Minnesota oak at 92 proof, you could pick it out. So the 92 proof, whatever is happening in that barrel in Virginia is, is coming to the forefront, you know? And it's a oh. weird thing about chemistry and proof. I mean, proof is so unusual for different spirits. You know, sometimes things go away at the low proof and sometimes they don't become evident unless they're at this proof. And so it's those kinds of proofing experiments that Becky had done to basically find in the uh, hone in, you know, which barrels are for what. And so now the predominance of our 92 proof product is in the Virginia wood. Gotcha. And then one last corollary on this topic again is uh, when you proof down, is the water source that you use something that you're particularly proud of, fond of? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. And that's a great question. I saw it asked earlier in the comment. I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, so in the 80 proof product, 60% of the product is water, right? Okay. And so that's kind of important. So the water is um, for us sourced from a reservoir. So we sit nestled right in the Blue Ridge Mountains. So we're right up against the Shenandoah Valley. We're just on the eastern side of that valley about five miles from the Appalachian Trail, right? So this beautiful deciduous hardwood forest that's been, you know, since the beginning of our country, gorgeous um, land that we live in. And up in the top of the mountains is the JT Hurst Reservoir. And that reservoir is basically Appalachian rainwater runoff, right? And so just like the Kentucky folks will brag about their limestone and yeah. how that minerals affect that, you know, we sit in an area that has, you know, granite and quartz and all these wonderful minerals in our soil and clay you know, and these kinds of things. And so that water trickling through this environment, um, that's the water that we use then for, for mashing and for topping off the barrel. So if you were to take this and fill it with, you know, the barrels, proof it down with reverse osmosis water, which is pure water, or if you were say to, you know, bottle this at a, at a bottling plant in Ohio or something, it's not gonna taste the same. The water is a really important factor in, yeah. the, in the taste and the terroir as well. To that point, do you um, do you sell your water alongside of it? So if people want to <laughs> use it at home. <laughs> That's a good idea, actually. I had not thought of that. Yeah, um, I could get in the bottled water business, too. Yeah, there, there, are some... there are definitely distilleries who do it. And it is, oh, so yeah. if, if you are drinking these at home, especially since rye is spicy, these are higher proof. If any of them are drinking a little punchy for you, that's okay. Like everyone has a different palate. Get some water. Add a drop or two of water and just do a drop or two at a time and kind of see how that changes the, and honestly, if you're going to do it, do a side by side, like pour a little bit in a different glass, smell them. It will change the smell, the taste. Like it really opens things up, can smooth things out sometimes. Um, it can be a fun experiment to do it, a lineup of them and do one drop, two drop, three drop, four drops, because to see kind of where your, your perfect where your palate is. That's, yeah. that's very similar to the process that Becky uses actually when proofing yeah. these spirits down, you know? Well.
Yeah. What, what's also fun is if you take a glass and you put like, you know, just a, a, a drip of whiskey in the glass and then just let it sit overnight um, and come back the next day and smell it, it's going to smell like your wood shop back in high school. It's going to smell like sawdust and wood. And it tells you, you know, all the other stuff has evaporated away. And what's left is wood that was absorbed out of the barrel into the whiskey. And it, it's remarkable because it smells exactly like a fresh cut piece of wood. Yeah, that's great. Hey, I want to take a pause for a minute because we're all geeking out and super passionate and we're taking up all the airtime. Everyone have questions, comments, thoughts, anything at all. We'll be quiet for a minute and let you <laughs> jump in. Here. I just wanted to say that um, when I went in to buy, I didn't get the sample pack because I was not really on it, but I went in and bought a bottle today and the gentleman at uh, Mission Wine and Spirits in Pasadena talked about how fantastic you guys are and how amazing Becky's palette is. Mm. And he mentioned um, a maple. Yeah. Something, maybe you can talk about that at the end. For sure. Actually, um, I have- amazing, And he said it sold out really fast. And he said, next Christmas- you uh, I'm trying to reach with an earphone in my ear here. Um, <laughs> yeah, I actually, so we have done various cask proof versions. So this is one of our cask proof where we have done different kinds oh. of barrel finishes. So this is our hickory syrup barrel. And um, we have a maple syrup barrel as well. So maple was the first one we ever did. So while other people were out there doing port finished and sherry finished, um, Becky was looking for something different, right? We always wanna do something different. That's just Becky's nature. And so we were working at the time with a producer of maple syrup for your pancakes, you know? And he would take our barrels and he would age the maple syrup in those barrels to get the whiskey flavor into the maple syrup. Well, it took us a lot longer than it should have, but we eventually got smart and said, hey, wait a minute, let's get those barrels back yeah. and do that. And so we put that in there. And so what we were not trying to achieve is like a maple flavored whiskey. That's not what we're doing. You know, whiskey, if you were talking about the spectrum of flavors of whiskey, you could talk about all different flavors and maple would be one of them naturally in whiskey. And so it's, I like to think of it as like a soundboard or an equalizer and there's a note for maple and you can just turn that note up really high on it. And so that was a really nice, um, and we do that about once a year. So it does come out and you can get it, um, but it's only a yearly uh, thing because we only have so many of those barrels. You no, wait, grab it when you can. Hickory syrup. The hickory syrup is interesting because that's actually dates back to an old Indian recipe. So there's a producer here of hickory syrup. So just like you can make syrup from maple trees, they make a syrup from hickory trees. And it's a little bit different process. It involves boiling the bark and, and oh. things like that to infuse the flavor. But if you take this hickory syrup um, itself, not the, the whiskey, but the hickory syrup, and you mix it with tomato paste, you're on your way to make a really nice barbecue sauce. Really? Um, but, Interesting. But uh, yeah, wonderful. so we do a hickory syrup finished as well. And that's really lovely that too. Sounds great. Scott, Scott you, you mentioned Becky is always wanting to do something new. Hmm. So before, before we get off this call, I want to make sure we talk about your at least four brandies and your gin. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Anyway, back to whiskey. <laughs> Scott, and Scott, I'll just say, if, if you want a blast from the past in terms of a finished bottle, Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Keep that up there for a minute. I'm going to spotlight you because we, we're all talking and let's see. Yeah, I want to see this. Hit that, hit that. We'll I, I should have the two year oh, on the wow. shelf somewhere, but we recently moved and I can't find it right now. Yeah, the two year um, is perhaps is two my favorite bottle of all time uh, I, of everything we've ever done is probably that two year old single cask nation. I, I, I agree. The two year is astounding. This is great. But the two years is standing. The two years is certainly the best two-year-old whiskey I've ever had in my life. Yeah, it it, it was a, it was that serendipity I was talking about it earlier. That was the two-year-old was the Chardonnay cask, and we just put yeah. it in there, not knowing what in the hell to do with it, and it turned out to be an amazing, amazing whiskey. Jason Johnston Yellen, who runs that company, had taken it to Scotland and was blind tasting it to Scottish distillers and bartenders, and they were guessing 11, 12, 13 years and stuff. They couldn't. Oh, wow. No, it was insane. And of course, all that color completely Kathy natural. About how many barrels do you distill each year? Like how small are you? What's your kind of... Yeah, so, so I like to talk in bottles. And so if you divide the number of bottles that I say by about 120 you'll, or 180, you'll get the number of barrels. But um, we did last year, well, in 2019, we did 60,000 bottles. So still really a small distillery. You know, we're still pretty much craft distillery. In 2020, 
we were, um, because of COVID, we were hoping to get 0% growth, right? So what we didn't, we didn't have any growth, but we didn't want to have any loss, right? We we're just to trying to hold our own like everybody else in the world. And in 2009, we did about 60, or sorry, 2020, we did about um, 60,000 bottles as well. So we held the line. Um, and this year with our expansion this year, we're hoping to up that to about 100,000 bottles. So that is, you know, I don't know how many um, six pack cases that is, but you know, you can kind of do the math there. Um, something math wise that I'm happy to do, but uh, 60,000 bottles comes from how many acres of rye? Oh, that's a good question. So I would estimate probably about three to 400 acres of rye. For okay, us. thanks. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a lot, it's a lot of rye. Um, we use about a ton right now at current at current production rates. We're using about a ton and a half to two tons of rye per week. Mm. So it's a lot. Um, how does a distiller make a decision about what states to expand into? Um, sometimes we flip a coin. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes sometimes the states will knock on our door and 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 make a case and we'll agree and and go into them. And sometimes we decide that a state is really important that we really want to be in it because you know, it has a really important drinking city in it, um, San Francisco, you know, um, New York and places like that. So we're kind of deciding based on sort of some demographic and, and those kinds of data. Also, well. you have to figure, you have to look at whether or not it's a control state. Absolutely. That's, that's or a worse, whole other approach. Franchise states, you know, those, those states are killer for distillers too, because they, you, you're married for life. Um, in some of those states. So that's that's another big consideration. Because you're pitching to a bureaucrat rather than the market. Right, right. Yep. So, um, hey, Scott, you're, you're a great mixologist. You make great cocktails. Can you treat us to some of your favorite cocktails that you make with your rye whiskeys and kind of yeah. play around with? Yeah, I get my little spirits journal. I'm tethered with my ear, so I have to <laughs> reach back here carefully. So I have a little like, you know, home spirits journal. And we actually like, we'll hand write drinks that we come up with um, and things like that. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of a fun little, it's the best diary I've ever kept, you know, where you can kind of keep, I, I can't see the camera and look at it yeah, at the okay. same time. But, um, you know, for instance, I'll give you, I'll give you a recipe right now. This is a fun one. And, and these, we don't, we don't claim to author all of these, you know, a lot of times these are made by some of our friends who are bartenders in DC and places like that. So one of our favorites is one called the Ric Flair, named after the wrestler. And it's actually created by a guy named Rick Newton, who also spells his name R-I-C with no K, um, who was a, at a place that's now unfortunately closed called Dino's in DC. Um, and it's the Ric Flair is an ounce and a half of rye I, I would have a recommendation as to which one. Um, about a half ounce of cherry hearing, a half ounce of Nardini Amaro, a half ounce of Cinzano uh, sweet vermouth. He liked the, the lower sort of, you know, everybody always wants to go to Carpano Antica, which is lovely, but he likes the, the lower amount of vermouth because there's a lot of other things going on with the Amaro in there. Um, a dash of Angostura and a dash of orange bitters. Um, and serve that um, with a, in a rocks glass, a big rock and an orange twist. So that's kind of a really neat sort of little bit of a take on an old fashioned with cherry. Hey, give us that one more time. I'm throwing it in the chat. After the Nardini Amaro. What's that? What was the ingredient after the Nardini Amaro? Oh, I see you're doing it in the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. ounce and a half of rye, okay. half ounce of cherry hearing, a half ounce of Nardini Amaro, a half ounce of Cinzano sweet vermouth. Any, mm -hmm. any cheap sweet vermouth will do. Dash and, and of mango and orange, you've said. And a dash of orange. Yep, dash mm -hmm. of mango and a dash of orange. And then serve with an orange twist with a big rock. Yeah, most people who know Nardini know them for their grappa uh, yeah, yeah. And, and don't know them for their Amaro, but their Amaro is wonderful. Yeah, the, um, the, the grappa, and we have one of their like almond infused grappas here uh, at the home. And that's like Becky's secret little thing. If you get to taste that, then she really likes you. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very um, good. I don't have a preference with orange bitters. There's a lot of really good ones out there in the market. And I'll as often use Reagan's or, or any of the different brands that are available to me. Great. I um, love it. Yeah, that sounds um, Scott, I have a leg up on the competition here tonight as a competition as it were, in that I have a I, I have a bottle of the uh, bottled in bond. Yes, indeed. Talk the to us a bit hazard. about this release. Yeah, so so if you saw the pictures of our stills earlier. Um, you'll see that they were hybrid um, pot stills with a plate, a, a plate column above it. And um, 
that plate column is configurable so we can turn those plates on or off. And so when we're doing roundstone, we want a fairly highly refined spirit coming out for the relatively youthful spirit that's gonna go into the barrel. But with Rabble Rouser, Becky was again experimenting in the early days. She opened up all the plates and just let us get a really boisterous, robust spirit coming through. So the new make was much rougher, right? It doesn't taste as good as a new make spirit. There's a lot of fusel oils and things in it but there's a lot of stuff that wouldn't get stripped away and left behind by the distillation process. So letting all that come through, as I like to say, more of a hillbilly kind of distillation. Um, and then it needs time in the barrel. So we put it in the barrel for four years. Um, originally, when we first released the Rabble Rouser, the original labels don't say bottled and bond. It always qualified for that, but nobody cared about bottled and bond up until the last, say, four or five years or so. Now it's sexy. And now it's sexy because yep. now it's shorthand for, yes, we made it here. Um, every bit of it. And so that's our bottled and bonnet, of course, set to 100 proof by the government regulations. 100 proof is a lovely proof for a spirit like that. And so what you're going to find in the rabble rouser is it is more of a um, chewy, you know, there's a lot of other flavors happening in that spirit, even though it's the same mash bill and it's the same uh, barrel process. I have to say it is the, it is the sweetest, it has the sweetest palate. Mm. Of, of your four standard releases. Interesting, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a really neat spirit and it's a very limited, if you see that available in your area, grab it because you know we only do like a thousand bottles a year. It's really, really small run limited stuff. And so you don't have to yeah. drink a, a, a lot of it. You know, you can save it or whatever, but it's-, it's Speaking really of rare. availability, we have several questions on, on the chat right now about availability. Uh, someone in Ohio saying, Please make the case. How can we help? She asked, how can we help make the case for Ohio? Yeah. And also where in LA this is available? Yeah, so great questions. Um, we had the person from Pasadena. I guess that's kind of north of LA. Um, that east, had, due east. Due east, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mission Mission um, up there um, has mm -hmm. it. The um, uh, Everson Royce, I don't know if they're still running with COVID being what it is right now. Um, but they, they have it. Um, total wines across the nation have it um, in, in. I know California. if in Orange County uh, where I'm at, I time wine cellar carries your uh, carries your stuff. That's yeah, that's that's great. And then um, in um, Bevmos, Bevmos have it. Um, Bevmo did a barrel pick actually, so they have one of our barrel wow. selections nice. as well. Um, if you're in the Illinois area, Vinny's of course is kind of the place to go. Um, if you're in uh, uh, Texas, you know, then um, Total Wine and Specs. Um, so, you know, those kinds of places. And as, as to the Ohio people, Ohio actually is a, is a really compelling state for us. Um, you know, four major metropolitan areas, that's, that's exactly important. the biggest problem for us with Ohio right now is the fact that A, it was a control state, and B, it just went through some real histrionics as far as like the control system there was like really messed up and they were like delisting all kinds of things and cleaning up their inventory and having all these auctions and it was just like too messy so we had to stay away for a while we would definitely like to be in ohio um just not quite ready for it yet um you know if we can get becky's actually the the president of the american craft spirits association and she's working hard with you know people in the industry to try to get um, direct to consumer shipping allowed for spirits nationwide and that would really solve some of these problems right because then we don't have to necessarily crack some of these markets, we could just ship onesie twosies out to people as needed. Yeah, now they can I will say like, one thing about Becky, because right uh, I was just gonna say one, th one thing I, I wanted to say, thank you for Becky for all of the help that she's doing with direct to consumer and fighting for the federal excise tax reduction. She is a huge hero to a lot of us in the industry. Oh, that's great. Well, I, I'm sure she'd love to hear it. I, she, she has a very humble uh, attitude towards these things and doesn't take compliments well, but, um, but she is a hero. She's working so hard. If people knew what she did to save the industry on New Year's Eve, it was incredible. You know, she basically found the, the, the number two guy at the Health and Human Services, the guy who sits right under Azar, who's the, the cabinet appointee and convinced him that they were gonna kill the craft distilling business if they didn't release the FDA fees that were being retroactively assigned to people who made hand sanitizer. Um, 14K you know, per. 14K per, yeah. for, for your privilege to make hand sanitizer and help save the world, you now get assessed a $14,000 fee 
that you didn't agree to when you started that whole process. Um, and she got on the phone and by New Year's Eve, she had resolved that with the HHS and gotten the HHS to tell the FDA to renege that fee. So uh, she's my cheers hero. Cheers to Becky. Yeah, cheers uh, to yeah, Becky. To Becky, yeah, absolutely. I, I'm gonna get somebody to do a GoFundMe and we're gonna get the statue erected somewhere, so. <laughs> maybe, maybe Becky, can you talk to us? Can you talk to us about your brandies? Because you have four, you have four brandies in the portfolio, uh -huh. um, plus uh, plus a gin. Yeah, yeah. Let me talk about those briefly. So you know, shorthand for people who aren't in the know, brandy is basically whiskey made from fruit. So it's the same process. The the same. You know, whiskey starts with beer, and brandy starts with wine. And so, you know, the most common brandy, if you just say brandy and you don't say anything else, then that's talking about grapes, right? So grapes that are wine, um, then distilled on a pot still uh, or a column still, um, and then um, aged in a barrel. So exactly the same process as whiskey. Um, the two kind of brandies most people know about, of course, are cognac and armagnac. And uh, those are, of course, brandies um, from France. There's also a ton of California brandy as well, obviously. Um, so um, we also make brandies from other fruits. So we make brandies from uh, peaches, from pears, from apples. And the reason we choose those fruits is because those are the historical brandies that would have been made in colonial times. Peaches set fruit about two years before apples set fruit. So early colonists were planting peaches and making peach brandy. Then of course, this Virginia part that we live in is very big um, apple country. And so lots of people planting apples and making apple brandy. And so those are products that we like for the historical reason. But also, I, you know, I was born and raised in Germany and the tradition of fruit brandies in Germany is very strong. And so I kind of brought that into the, into the thing. Yeah, there's a picture of the, uh, go ahead and say something. The apple. So, yeah, there's the apple. Hmm. These come in 375s. Yep. There is the peach. And every one of these fruits that he's showing you is. Uh, and the pear. And the pear. And every one of these fruits that he's showing you is locally harvested fruit. So those pears come from 10 miles north of the distillery. The peaches come from six miles west of the distillery. And the apples come from Richmond, which is about two hours south of the distillery. So all local fruit. And your grapes are local as well. Yes? And the grapes are as well. Yeah, Loudoun County is a very um, rich grain, or uh, sorry, grape county. So we have about 40 different wineries and we like working with those winemakers. Of course, my wine background, I love the smell of, you know, wine and the harvest and being in that, that chaos that's happening once every mm -hmm. year. So we and really your gin? Sort of immerse ourselves into that. Can I ask, are your brandies available? Are they as available as your whiskey? They're not, they're super limited. So we have just a very limited amount of fruit. And so when we do brandy runs, we're talking like 336 bottles or something like that. So very small runs of those brandies. So think of it as a treat. So when COVID is over and you get to travel and you come to the distillery and visit, mm -hmm. that's a special thing that you're really gonna get to experience then. Okay, we'll do that. Thank hey, you. How are you? Yeah, really. um, how are you helping kind of educate consumers about brandy? Because brandy has a bad rap, right? A lot of people kind of feel like it's something that their grandparents and great grandparents drank and it's not for, you know, modern drinking. We and, need to make it hip again. Yeah. So yeah, how do and you- And a lot of Americans, a lot of Americans think it's sweet. Exactly. They, when they hear brandy, they think fruit liqueur. Right. Mm -hmm. Just because it's, it's just a misconception. A it is broad, absolutely. A, a, a widely held misconception. Yeah, they, they think of the blackberry schnapps they were drinking on a ski lodge when they were in college, you know, it's garbage. Um, and, uh, and, and we had to educate people. So when we first started having people taste our brandies, they returned it because they were expecting bowls. And we're like, oh my God, no, it's not that at all. And so we had to start telling people, just setting an expectation in their head. Think of this as like a cognac, but made from pears, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So at least cognac put them up on the right level, you know, to think about it. Um, and it's not sweet. It is the essence of the fruit, literally the essence of the fruit. Um, so we also have to educate people when they say pear brandy, it's made from pears only. It's not a pear flavored brandy, right, which exists. It's a brandy made from pears. So we take pears, we squeeze them into cider, we ferment the cider, we then distill that fermented cider and then age it in a barrel. So it, it's made from nothing but pears. Um, so those are the kind of processes that we go through and educate people about. Yeah. And what distinguishes your gin? So the gin, 
um, is a, it's a great thing to talk about because gin came about as like the number two product we started making behind the whiskey. So when we do our whiskey, we do our heads, hearts, and tails, right? And so our tails um, that we have, the tails are the non-flavorful alcohols at the end of the process. They taste bitter. They smell like mold and old socks, you know, so you don't want that in the whiskey. So you cut it, you remove it, but the tails still have about 50% ethanol in them. And you never throw that down the drain. You don't waste ethanol. In Scotland, they'll take the tails and they'll put it into the next batch to try to recoup some of the lost ethanol. But in our case, we will take the tails and accumulate them and distill them separately. And in doing so, by separately distilling them, you can squeeze all those fusel oils to the back of the second distillation and recover about 80%, 90% of the ethanol that would have been lost. Now that ethanol has very little flavor because all the flavor came out during the run of the hearts in the whiskey process. So that alcohol is quasi neutral. And so therefore we will introduce to it coriander, cinnamon, anise, juniper, orange peel, and basically make an herbal tea. So we do a maceration of herbs into that spirit. And then we'll take the macerated herbs out and give those to like a local chef. who will use them for all kinds of chefy stuff. And then we'll take the liquid, what we call a gin wash, and then redistill it in a pot still. And that's very unique for gin. Usually gin is done in a basket, um, but we do it in a pot still. So you're getting an enormous amount of botanical oil coming through in the distillation, which gives, when you have oil and alcohol, it gives it wonderful mouthfeel and viscosity. And so you're getting a really rich, nice gin with this viscosity built on a rye base. And the rye base gives it this really like sweet base that tastes sweet, but there's no sugar in it. So you get this kind of really interesting gin with the kind of a winter spice profile. So it's a 100% rye gin. That's right. And so it hmm. says on the bottle, you know, rye based gin, and that makes it a little bit unique too. So it really hmm. truly is an outgrowth of the whiskey production process. Yeah. yeah and so that's the way uh, craft distilleries, you know, the usual path is vodka, mm -hmm. gin, yeah. all while you're waiting for your whiskeys till you, while your whiskeys are laying down and ready for release two yeah. to three more years. But you, you, you led with whiskey. Yeah, we did. And that was actually, you know, we, we had planned to do that exact business plan that you talked about. But when we went to the Virginia ABC, which was going to be our first customer, and of course, that's a control state. So that's a bureaucrat you're talking to. Um, and we, we came in with three products. We came in with a moonshine, we came in with a gin, and we came in with the whiskey, right? And the whiskey had literally been aged for one month in one of those little bitty barrels like this. I had done the labels on an ink, like we were that much of a rush to get this product in front of the ABC. And when we were done with that process, a few weeks later, when they came back, they said, we have decided to choose one of your products to list in the state of Virginia. And they were like, hooray, it's the whiskey. And we're like, oh, shit, like, what are we going to do? Like, we just started in January. This was like March. And so the first whiskey we were putting out was very, very, very young because it had to be. That was the, we had no option. If we didn't do that because it's not the right thing to do, we'd be out of business and it'd all be over tomorrow. So we started putting out whiskey and it was good. And it, it was brown and it had enough flavor and most people <laughs> liked it. And, and we were able to evolve it to where we have it today. But in the early days, I mean, if you grab one of those early bottles and you turn it around, it says age 1.5 months, you know, it was really, really young. <laughs> Hopefully it was in a really small barrel for 1.5 months. Right? <laughs> right. Yeah, we were using 30 gallon barrels at that time, even then. Wow. So, but it, it was more of an, a, a blonde than it was an amber. Let's say that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's as long as it wasn't beige. Yeah, <laughs> and, it, and it was translucent mostly. Tell us a little bit about the the growing pains. I mean, it, it is such a crazy story that, you know, what, what has it been now? It was five years, 10 years ago. Like you guys had completely different lives. You weren't distillery owners. You weren't making spirits. Right. And now you have this whole different life and different, like, were there points in that early phase where you were like, what did we do? And this why are we still doing it? <laughs> we, we still do. Yeah. Um, you know, to be an entrepreneur is to be, um, somebody with a manic depressive kind of disorder, right? Because I mean, you're constantly <laughs> having these ups and downs. Um, you know, one day we're floating on air because we get a nice story from somebody like Rich, you know, and we feel like we're kings of the world, you know, and then, and then, you know, we have some crisis and, and, you know, I'd sell the whole business for a dollar, you know, sure. um, it, it's just, it, that's the way it is. And, and we've gotten used to that roller coaster. I can tell you, you know, as we were first getting started, um, you know, like 
availability of cash. You know, you can go broke putting whiskey into a warehouse. And so that is a tricky thing to manage. And we had to learn like, okay, we can't just produce endlessly. Like we have to manage our production against our sales numbers and try to match them as best we can so that we have some inventory, but, but not enough that, you know, we've spent everything on grain and, and that's, you know, mm -hmm. finances that you can't even get your hands on anymore. Um, if it, you know, if you needed to really quickly. Um, so things like that, we had some crises as we went through, you know, some really tough days when, you know, we have like say four or five people working for us at this point who have families and, you know, they're supporting their families and, um, you know, and we're not going to make payroll, you know, because, you know, it's August and nobody's buying whiskey. You know, we have these doldrum periods. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, Becky and I would, would look at each other and we'd be like, you know, we, we need to come up with $50,000, you know? And so it's like, you know, shall I dip into our savings at home to make payroll so that these four people can get a paycheck this week? Yeah. And they it's say a the very difficult thing to do, but you know, the two you, shortest routes to bankruptcy are financing a film mm -hmm. and opening a distillery. Yeah, and it's true. And and so you know, we got a few lifelines thrown to us, you know, um, you know, along the way, you know, which were really great because you know you can only do so much with bank lending. You know, the banks are really not interested in working with small business. Yeah. That you know, they'll they'll happily you know take a note on a building that they can resell. Um, but they have no interest in, you know, if you're in a growth phase and you're, you know, you're in the red and you're, but you're investing in marketing and sales and things like that. Banks don't want to hear anything about that. And so, you know, we've had dozens of banks tell us no, um, as we are on this journey to grow this brand. And so those kinds of things can be really, really disheartening. And when, you, let me tell you, if you have a set of employees who are doing well, that's great. But if you have a set of employees who might be, you know, having some kinds of issues and you're dipping in your pocket to pay $70,000 to, 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 so they can have their paycheck, you become really salty if yeah. they, you know, if they're not giving it their all, because you're literally giving it your all and they may not even know you're doing it, but it does, it does have an effect on your psychology. And you have to, as an owner, I think, push that down because you can't have that infect you know, what would be otherwise a good team spirit and environment. But those are the challenges that we face and the things that, you know, keep us up at nights. There's always sort of a latent level of low level anxiety that's always sort of simmering in there that those recurring college dreams about being in your underwear, taking a test, you know, those happen to me all the time. Yeah. Because it's just that anxiety that's always with us. Yeah. And so what's coming up for the future? Anything exciting you can sneak preview or any new Ooh. things you guys are thinking about or what's, what's the future hold? Yeah, we have some exciting stuff coming out. Um, probably the most exciting thing that a lot of people are nuts about is our collaboration with Guar, the rock band. So um, if you're not familiar with Guar, go check them out. They're kind of <laughs> crazy. Um, wow. They are. Um, we, they are actually a Richmond based band. So they were fans of the brand before we sort of knew who they were. I, I will admit fully, I'm an easy listening kind of guy. So when, when Guar came to us, I kind of checked them out and it was like, you know, mock beheadings on a, on a stage from these aliens that invaded from outer space and things like that. So this was like really out of my comfort zone, <laughs> but um, Becky put together some really great whiskey for the band. They're really, really neat guys. And, and they got some really cool stuff going on. So we're doing a collaborative whiskey with them. Um, they're designing a lot of the artwork that's going to go on the label. So it's really in keeping with sort of that gothy kind of intergalactic space alien um, theme. Um, but the whiskey that's going into it is whiskey that Becky's been playing with some other research that's aging in other woods that would have been influenced in the Virginia area. So here we're wow. talking things like sugar maple and mm. cypress and um cypress yeah and yeah. so there's there's a few different wood types that she's used and what was the other oh cherry cherry wood um mm -hmm. and so you know those kinds of woods that are native in in, in this area um because with guar we're, we're obviously wanting to sort of hone in on more of that virginia stuff even though guar is from outer space you know they have representatives from richmond <laughs> 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 that's, fun. that's great and you, you and Becky were recently named to the Imbibe Top 75. That's exciting. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. That was really sweet. That was a really nice honor. We, I don't, you know, they, they did that because of the work, I think, that Becky and I, you know, sort of spearheaded with the COVID crisis last year. Um, we did a um, collaborative whiskey called In This Together. Hang on, I have a bottle here. Um, 
Oh, I'm on the tether. <laughs> Hang on, I gotta take my microphone off. Oh shit! <laughs> Just kind of cleared my bar. He said it again. Oh, it's terrible. I'm too tethered to this thing. Um, here it is. So we have this um, in this together rye whiskey here, and basically what that came to be from was. Um, we had restaurants during the beginning of the COVID crisis, like March, April timeframe, that could not um, sustain their barrel selection. So they had already bought and paid for whiskey that was a private barrel pick. And it, in fact, it was bottled and delivered um, to them. And these restaurants were fighting for their existence. They didn't know if they were gonna be here the next day. And so they asked us, can they return it? And of course, I mean, we could have said no, but you know, all of these restaurants you know, for the past 10 years were what put us on the map. How could we say no? So we had four restaurants return their whiskey. And then we took that whiskey and Becky was, we were like, what are we going to do with it? You know, we just want to break even on it. You know, are we just going to do nothing with it? And so Becky decided, let's try taste, tasting it, blending it and seeing what happens. And they were really different flavors. So one was a, a stable craft beer barrel. One was a Chardonnay barrel. And then one of them was, I'm, I'm forgetting now, but I think it was a peach barrel. Mm. Um, and we blended those barrels together and the different notes, the fruit note and the um, Chardonnay, which was a kind of a wine note. And then the beer note, the maltiness really actually, instead of fighting each other kind of blended together really nicely. And so we released it um, out to the public. We had a hundred cases of whiskey, 600 bottles and a um, hundred cases. We put it on our online store and it sold out in two hours. It was incredible, absolutely incredible. And so we took every bit of profits from it. We broke even on our cost and every bit of profits we, we gave to charity, um, to four different restaurant charities that were supporting um, people who are out of work, um, the people in the kitchen um, who are usually immigrants and don't speak English, um, all of these different people who, who you know, were literally in food lines at the time um, $12,000 uh, that we were able to raise and give away for that process. And so, you know, we just did it because it was the right thing to do. And we wanted to, you know, recoup our loss, but it turned into something bigger than that. And I guess that's why they gave us the, the recognition, you know, and it was a really nice thing to do. Yeah, it's really amazing. I mean, you know, it's, it's always hard for restaurants and craft distillers and all of it, you know, it's, it's tough business to be in at any time, but this yeah. past year, it's been incredibly tough for people who work in these industries. And it, and takes, a, it takes a big heart when you're struggling yourself to turn around and be generous. Yeah, That's, absolutely. Yeah, yeah it, it's hard, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, we've got to do what's right or what we can be proud of, you know, nothing else really matters, you know, yeah. so. That's right. Well, we're really proud to have you on the show and to support you. So, and thank you to all of our guests who showed up and hung out with us for an hour and a half to, yeah. to support you. And, uh, you know, hopefully all of you are going to go out and find some Catoctin Creek rye. If you didn't already get your sampler pack, you're going to go get one because it's really great stuff. It's so good. And as you all heard tonight, they have such an amazing story behind it as well, which makes it all that more enjoyable. Yeah, Scott, you, know? you weave a great story. Yeah. <laughs> thank absolutely. you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, you know, we're happy to stick around for, for a little bit longer. If you guys have some questions at all. You want to unmute yourselves and chit chat a little bit, but otherwise, you know, we are at the 90 minute point. So I'll let everyone kind of say their goodbyes and, and take off. But thank you so much, Scott, for being here and give Becky our love and I will. tell her all the nice things we were all saying about her here. <laughs> have a great night. Scott. Scott. Good to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Evan. Evan, thank you so much again. It's great to see you guys on the screen. Yeah. Very best to Becky. Yes. Thank you. Phil. Yes, take absolutely. Care, guys. Please. Everybody be well. Thank you. Good, everyone.